scripture lesson this morning comes from Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 8 and it reads as follows so brothers and sisters because of God's mercies I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God this is your appropriate priestly service don't be conformed to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is what is good and pleasing and mature because of the grace that God gives me I can say to each of you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think instead be reasonable since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you we have many parts in one body but the parts don't have the same function in the same way though there are many of us we are one body in Christ individually we belong to each other we have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace that has been given to us if your gift is prophecy you should prophesy in proportion to your faith if your gift is service devote yourself to serving if your gift is teaching devote yourself to teaching if your gift is encouragement devote yourself to encouraging the one giving should do it with no strings attached the leader should lead with passion and the one showing mercy should be cheerful the word of God for the people of God thanks be to God Hmm. let's bow in prayer send the power of your Holy Spirit in our midst O oh God continue to send it that we might open our ears and our hearts to hear your word to each of us that these ancient and familiar images might become real and living to us and through us amen well, this is one of my favorite passages. I'm not sure I could quite tell you why. I just know that over the years, I have loved this sort of flow of therefore, and I learned it in some different translations, but therefore, in view of God's mercies or in view of God's grace, and it goes on to say, let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's I, probably the piece that kind of captured my imagination. And it may also have been a little bit of my desire to kind of hop over that image of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Somehow there's something about that that just gives me the willies or the heebie-jeebies, or as uh, one of the children at the 8 o'clock service when Pastor Kerry was uh, inviting them to think about, so what would it be if our bodies were, our, you know, all, you know, if we had eyes instead of every, and one of them looked up and said, that would just be creepy. <laughs> I thought, well, yes. Uh, and if each of you came in this morning with either uh, the first fruits of your garden or with the best animal of your flock, um, it would not be a... a well, it's just, I don't even want to think about the carpet. Let's put it that way. But then I am aware that if I'm honest, that I have, um, we just don't think a lot about sacrifice, particularly not of living things. And yet, in the biblical times, that was a way of offering something to God. Now, if you were to Google sacrifice, that being the way that most of us check the dictionary these days, you get a variety of things. One of which is the, the giving or even the destruction of something in order to serve a larger purpose. It can be the offering of something precious to God. And then there are sort of sub illustrations and you can click on sacrifice bunt, sacrifice fly, 
and, and there's all the sort of athletic images where a sacrifice in those senses is something that is done that doesn't benefit the individual player. I mean, they're gonna end up out, but the team scores. And that's not really a bad image. There, there's something that the individual offers for the larger purpose. Now, it is easy to have a sort of shallow and caricatured vi vision of what a sacrifice is. I've demonstrated a few of them. Others would include something that we give to kind of settle down an angry God. Or that it's a transaction. We come in, offer our sacrifice, go home with forgiveness. It almost makes it sound like going down to Tasty's and we go in and make our uh, payment and we go home with something that um, is satisfying to us. May not be good for us, but it is satisfying to us. A sacrifice viewed that way is sort of viewed as an obedience to a law or something that we do to satisfy God, or to benefit God. But really, that is not at all what Paul's attention, uh, what Paul's intention were, and it's not really the point even of the ancient view of sacrifice. It wasn't something that we did to get God's attention. It's something that is a habit that trains our attention. It's not something done to adjust God's attitude. It's, it's a habit and a behavior that adjusts our attitude. And it's not to persuade God to do something that God's going to do anyway. Instead, it is to persuade or train us to conform to God's purposes and to act on God's behalf. And then Paul goes on to declare that this offering is, in the common English, it's kind of an interesting image because it's that sense of appropriate priestly service. You, if you grew up with other translations, you may think of that as our spiritual worship or our rational or logical worship because that, that sense of rational thinking in contrast to all of nature which can sing God's praises but can't really reflect on why God is worthy of that praise. We, on the other hand, are thinking beings and we can offer gifts that are thinking, logical, appropriate. Therefore, Paul says, we get to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. It starts from the inside and it will transform us on the outside. And we're not to be conformed to the world. I love J.B. Phillips when he says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold because there is a whole lot of sort of worldly peer pressure that does not end up with us being shaped like Christ. Instead, he says, don't let the world squeeze your inner mold, but be transformed, transformed into the image of Christ, the image of God, through the renewing of our minds, which is to say we get to think some new thoughts. Now, it would be easy to spend more time than any of us had intended contrasting the way the culture views a bunch of things and the way God does. But I want to just go through a few of them related to money. The culture says, it's mine, I earned it, I worked for it, and I'll spend it any way I please. Now that may be a little bit of an exaggeration. Some of you are looking at each other because there is a sense of recognition you know, have it your way because by golly, you've earned it. The culture says it's driven by our own agenda and preferences and has this odd sense that if we give something away, somebody else will have more and we'll have less. And it probably won't be enough. That may um, sound familiar. It, on the other hand, is not. God's intention. God has a rather different point of view and with the resources, the money that we have, as we become increasingly God-shaped, we increasingly let God set the agenda and the purposes for how we spend them. Not just on what we might give to a church or a ministry, but how we spend all the rest of it as well. 
as we grow in our shaped uh, by the image of God, we recognize that, yeah, we may have earned it, but the capacity to work is a gift from God itself. And the opportunities that we may have had are themselves gifts. And all good gifts, if you track them back, really come from God. And then there's this odd mathematics in the household of God that says if you give to and for and through God's purposes, you'll still have enough. It doesn't make rational sense, perhaps, but it does make divine sense. When I first started learning to tithe, the math was easy. I could do percentages and figure out 10%. And I will confess that as I, in those first days, wrote my check for $2.50, which tells you something about what my allowance was when I was 17, but that was for two weeks, um, that, that it, you know, at that point, $2.50 would still buy something. And so I would sometimes think about what else I might have done with that. And as my income grew and that check grew, I did still now and then think about, well, what else could I, might I, would I have done with that? But oddly enough, and, and, and it is a kind of an odd transition, after a while, I, I began to get more interested and excited in the good that the money was doing, rather than, well, now, if I had kept that, I could have, it, it just shifted over time. And, Eventually, it stopped feeling quite so much like my money, but instead it was money that I held for a while and then got to participate with God in using it. And I will just tell you, this does not make sense until you try it. I wish I could kind of, you know, make it seem more reasonable, but it isn't. It's just, there's something about that percentage that allows us to begin to trust that there's enough. And in the same way that you can't learn to swim until you actually get in the water, I mean, you can read the book, you can watch all the YouTube videos in the world, you can practice the strokes or whichever ones you're wanting to practice, you can practice breathing, maybe even the sink or the tub at home, but until you actually get in the water, you will not experience that transition that happens when you realize the water will hold you up. That there, it, particularly if you take a deep breath, there will be a sense in which you can trust that you will survive and learn to enjoy it. Trusting that the water will support you rather than insisting, I will stand on my own two feet where I know it's safe. I, I think that for many of us, making some kind of a pledge to the annual budget is that learning to swim. It cultivates a habit, and it makes it in a one-year increment, but for some folks, even a one-year pledge card is a very scary thing because there is this fear that if I give some away, I won't have enough. <coughs> but in beginning, wherever you can, it develops the habit. And it gives practice in learning that if you give God what is first and best, rather than what's left over and last, that it works. And it's practice in trusting God. Now, I would, for, for many, a three-year capital campaign is deep water. And I would suggest that if you are not already pledging to the annual campaign, start there. If you're not putting anything at all in the offering plate, even your attendance card, start there. <laughs> and then put, yeah, so, so take whatever step you can that stretches your trust but doesn't terrify you. I have occasionally seen, and I'll confess I have some relatives who thought it was a perfectly reasonable thing to teach their kids to swim by throwing them in the water. Like, no, you don't want to scare them away from the water forever. You, you teach them to acquire the skills 
so that they can learn to swim with some sense of confidence. And as I said, that three-year campaign above and beyond the vanilla card for the annual campaign is a scary thing for some people. But in other parts of our lives, we've probably practiced making a commitment and then living into it. Some of you have had the training as Stephen ministers. Some of you have taken disciple Bible study. And when you first heard, you mean the class is going to last the whole school year? I mean, great, we're going to read 80% of the Bible. But did you say that was going to be like, isn't that 32 or 33 weeks? Oh, but if you made the commitment and lived into it, you discovered that there was um, the growth and the relationships that was very different from a sort of hit and miss, I'll come when I feel like it, but I won't do any homework. I mean, those are different um, levels of um, commitment when you get right down to it. Some of you have had the Stephen ministry training. 50 hours of training. Did you say 50 hours with the same people? And if you have done it, you know how precious it is to go through that personal growth and the spiritual development and the practical skills that enable you to help in a way far beyond um, just sort of looking at a YouTube video to listen carefully. I mean, it, it's a world of difference. And if you've joined a team, an athletic team, if you've joined a band, something that requires a weekly commitment over time, if you've joined a civic or charitable organization, if you receive a work responsibility, you know the difference between, yes, I am all in, you can count on me, or, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. I mean, there's, there's a big difference. And, uh, presided at a wedding last night and was re reminded of some of the words in the wedding service that talks about these two persons who come now to give themselves, to give themselves in marriage. And in the ring vow, there's a sense of, with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you. Did the song end with, I surrender all? You know, we talked about singing that at the 8 and 11 services, but some, somebody some year said, we sing I Surrender All, but that's an aspirational goal. For most of us, if we were to sing it honestly, we'd be singing I Surrender Some, and we'd be negotiating just how much that was. But there is, if we make this commitment to let God transform us from the inside by helping us think some new thoughts, that lead into new patterns of behavior. He says we can actually grow in our ability to seek and discern God's will. And that with increasing confidence, we can discover what God's will is for us. We can do that with increasing, I mean, we, we can learn to do it better and better. And then we can learn what our gift is. Now he's talking spiritual gifts there and that is also very important to discover. Is your gift leadership? If so, serve with passion and diligence. Is your gift helps or encouragement? If so, encourage. If it's generosity, then do that without strings attached. If it is showing mercy, do that with cheerfulness. It's part of what they teach you in the Stephen ministry. Don't just wallow in the, the uh, angst. Do so in way, not wallowing, but help, encourage with cheerfulness. And as we each discover what our gift is to share, and as we each do that, then all together we're better. Interesting language there that we belong to each other. Not just with each other, because we can do things that the other one doesn't, or they can do something that we, we belong to each other. I read a story, it, it's true I think, although it may have uh, been edited as it went into publishing, um, of uh, a 
pastor in the Oklahoma conference, a notable pastor, uh, Jim Buskirk, who went regularly skiing with some friends. From that area, I think you would pile in the car and go skiing periodically in the same way that some of us go to the beach with friends. Um, I have some colleagues with whom I have gone to the beach twice a year, and Fran, I know this is awful to admit since we live close to the beach. I'm otherwise not a beach person. So often, that's the two times a year that I put my bathing suit on and go to the beach. But I do that because of the relationships with those friends. So he had a group that would go skiing. And so they drove uh, to a cabin that was in a ski area, and they, they were adequately proficient and eager skiers. Actually, they were probably pretty good. They didn't report details about that. The cabin was in an area where they would then go out to catch the lifts to go further up the hill, but behind it was a mountain that was not served by any lifts. And they didn't do anything with that, except that this year there was just enough snow to put that magical layer of powder on things. If you're a skier, you, you know something about what that is and how enticing it is. And so one of the guys said, why don't we put on our hiking boots and carry our gear and hike up that hill and then ski down because nobody has skied that. Three or four of the others said, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'll do that. Jim Buskirk and someone else that he would have described, I think, as very sensible, looked at the other guys and said, y'all are out of your minds. Why would you carry all that heavy equipment up there to an area that's not served by a lift when we can just put it on and go out and ski the areas served by the lift. Y'all go do what you want, but we're going to stay right here by the fire and enjoy some hot coffee. So they did, and they sat there and felt very, very sensible and satisfied in their, their um, good judgment but they were able to watch as the others did labor up the hill. Ski equipment is only graceful when you're in it and on it. If you're carrying it, it's really awkward. And, and so they were working hard getting up that hill. And then they switched to their ski equipment, tossed their boots in their backpacks, and came down with a sense of delight and satisfaction that was very different qualitatively than the smugness of the guys with their coffee. So the skiers came back in just bubbling over with, you, oh, you should have done it. It was magnificent. And one of them looked at the two with the coffee and said, you know, you guys missed the very best part of our entire trip. Now, I will say that a capital campaign for some people feels like hiking up the mountain, carrying heavy equipment. It's a lot of work. It is. There's no two ways about that. But I remember when we were getting ready to do the first one, getting ready to do uh, some of the necessary improvements and maintenance, and some folks were really eager. Oh, let's get on with it. And others were very rattled. Could we do a little less? Ugh. And there were a number of folks who didn't participate in the first one. And I want to say that for some folks, it just feels safer to sit by the fire. And if that's your honest choice, it's okay. I think there are some folks who by nature are not risk takers. And the project's the, op the p possibility of paying off a 20-year mortgage in about three years just seems very, very big. It seems too hard. And you can think of a million reasons, or maybe 1.9 of them, why we probably shouldn't do that. But there are quite a few others who feel that's where God is leading. And so... If you don't want to go along, that's okay. And I will say that churches being what they are, never mind churches, human communities being what they are, the folks drinking their coffee by the fire are probably going to have some narrative about why that's more sensible. Ah, but when 
it's over. And when the mortgage is being burned, when the ministries are flourishing because of the improvements that have happened, and that's not just ministries in an abstract way, when lives are being changed because the facilities are accessible and multi-use, and when that debt is paid off and there is energy and eagerness about the next chapter that we can't even fully describe, when that is all being celebrated, my fear is that for some, you might have missed the best part of the adventure. Because it is an adventure. It requires risk and trust. And God allows, invites each of us to consider what our response will be. What is the gift that has been given that we might share for God's work together. Amen. Will you pray with me?